Um, I think we can start in the next few minutes. I can see a couple of people are joining into the session. Hello. Good morning again, everyone, and welcome back, and welcome to the people that are just joining us for this session. Uh, we'll, the session on social determinants of mental health, we will have a brief recap on what we covered, and then we'll go into the rest of the session. Um, I don't know. You're muted, Alexia. <laughs> Thanks, Pearl. I'm happy to start um, off with the recap. Um, my name is Alexia Wolf, and um, welcome back to everyone who was in the first session, and, and welcome to any newcomers. Um, I am the Chief of Social Determinants in the Health Integration Bureau in Delaware, uh, one of the one of the states in the US. And um, our first session really focused on the importance of environmental factors in overall health. Um, one of the key takeaways is that environmental factors account for about 80% of overall health outcomes. Those are things like environment, food security, uh, employment, all, all of the social determinants that we touched on. 
Um, and we talked about the fact that the social determinants are all very interconnected um, and that many of the areas, if you look at the model uh, for the ecological model, um, which includes health policy, um, um, neighborhood built environment, many of those factors are outside of the locus of control of the clinical team. Um, and so taking uh, an approach to addressing unmet social needs requires a great deal, deal of collaboration. Um, that presents an, an incredible opportunity, but at the same time, collaboration can be hard. Um, and you know, we talked about some of those challenges. Um, we had some great feedback from the participants. Um, I will pause here, uh, Pearl and Susan, in case there's anything you want to add from the first session. Um, thank you so much, Alexia. I think what came out for me um, in the first session from the feedback is that the social determinants and the is something very new and it can sound like a lot of information or a lot to take in but it takes a lot of collaboration like alexia has said and with collaboration i think we can take into account and take into consideration all the different uh social determinants and without that it's a bit difficult to achieve health equity um yeah i think that's what really came out for me and i think the aspect of housing and um poverty as well and mostly safe housing came out as well religion as well came up and the stigma associated with mental health came up in the first session so yeah thank you so much alexia and susan i'm looking forward to the next session sure and and anything you'd like to add susan And, and just to recap, our plan for the second part of the workshop is to do a, a brief overview of the approach that we're taking to health integration and addressing social determinants, and then turn it over to Pearl uh, to do a facilitated dialogue about the vision for Zambia in terms of social determinants of mental health. Yeah, so um, like we had said in the first session, it's a very interactive session. We expect the participants to take part. Uh, give us your feedback. If you can't, if your audio isn't working, please feel free to use the chat. Um, let's try and make it as interactive as possible. Your feedback, your insights are very valuable, especially when it comes to the session, the dialogue session on uh, creating a vision for Zambia, where we see Zambia in the next few years, where you want us to be when it comes to um, health equity and holistic mental health services. Thanks, Pearl. Next slide. Um, Susan and I are in the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health in Delaware. That is the, the state division for public mental health and substance use services. And we provide and oversee uh, those behavioral health treatment services for individuals who are 18 years of age and older in our state. And our mission is to improve the quality of life for adults with behavioral health conditions by promoting their health and well being and fostering their self sufficiency and protecting those at risk. As we discussed in the first part of this session, unmet social needs often prevent individuals from accessing, um, navigating, and sustaining recovery resources. And the goal of our Bureau is to address the social determinants that account for 80% of overall health outcomes. Um, we do this through an integrated community-based system of recovery supports with the result of improved well-being for the individuals we serve and thriving, resilient communities. Um, our goal is always to have people in our services living like any other Delawarean 
um, in a community setting. As we touched on earlier, uh, we use the recovery model. That is really the core of everything we do. And um, that the, the foundation of that is that recovery is a process of change uh, through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. And then the four dimensions for a life in recovery that we, we spoke about earlier are health, home, a sense of purpose, and community. And then on the right, you can see the, the different dimensions of wellness. Um, a, a big component of our approach is that wellness includes more than clinical services. So you can see all of the dimensions and how they relate to the social determinants of health. Uh, people in recovery develop new meaning, purpose, and identity as they grow beyond the catastrophic effects of mental illness. People in recovery grow beyond the damaging effects of alcohol and drug misuse. People in recovery move from a management view of illness to a holistic wellness-centered view, and they grow beyond the effects of stigma and cultural barriers like classism, racism, sexism, and homophobia. Uh, we, we always take the approach that we want people to live the best life possible, to really live a full and meaningful life in the community. The, the uh, work that our Bureau does encompasses um, ho uh, home, peer support, community inclusion, employment and housing, primary care, food security, uh, legal services and transportation. Uh, we talked a lot in the first session about housing, the importance of housing uh, in, in terms of people being able to advance in their recovery and not having to put so much time and energy into getting their basic needs met. Um, peer support is, is another big focus of our, of our work. And as we discussed, um, we, we, uh, train people who have their own lived experience in recovery. They go through a rigorous training process to become certified as a peer specialist. Uh, the process includes classroom time and also work experience, and then they sit for an exam. Um, and we have found that to be very effective in engaging people in recovery. Um, Community inclusion is another big initiative uh, of our team. We are working with uh, national experts at a university in Philadelphia, which is uh, very close to us, um, on promoting opportunities for people in our services to engage in mainstream community activities. Um, and again, to have that sense of meaning, purpose, and belonging. Um, employment and education are so critical to what we do. Um, so many of the people that we serve want to work and may have gotten disabling messages over the years uh, that, that you know, they should curtail their dreams um, as far as what they want to do in the professional arena. So we have a number of initiatives underway to promote training opportunities um, or opportunities for people to return to school as part of their recovery. And again, that goes back to uh, promoting that sense of meaning and purpose and people really living a, a full life. Uh, primary care, as Susan spoke about earlier, is so important to what we do um, in terms of making sure that people are connected with a primary care health home. Um, we know that the people in our services die an average of 25 years earlier than their counterparts um, who are not, uh, who do not have uh, a similar mental health diagnosis. And so we're always working to close that gap and make sure that, um, that the person's whole health needs are being met. Food security is, is another area. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we've partnered with a nutritionist at an area university to offer a free nutritional consultation to people in our services. 
Um, oftentimes people have very, very limited resources uh, to obtain food. And so part of this is supporting people and making healthy choices and also developing um, a pantry of food so that if, you know, if there is a disruption in their income, um, they have some food on hand. In the area of transportation, um, we've recently launched a partnership with a number of rideshare services like Uber and Lyft to provide non-emergency medical transportation for people that we support um, so that that is not a barrier uh, if they're accessing treatment or if they need to get to a primary care appointment. And then in the legal arena, we have a partnership with Community Legal Aid. Um, that is a group of attorneys in our community um, who serve people with limited um, uh, income. And we've developed a partnership to essentially fast track people in our services with Community Legal Aid so that any unaddressed uh, legal issues can get resolved. Um, there's a substantial body of evidence that unresolved legal issues um, correlate with people accessing resources like the emergency room um, more frequently due to the stress of, of the issues. And so uh, getting those issues cleared up actually uh, improves people's overall health. Um, there is a tremendous social impact of untreated behavioral health conditions. Um, behavioral health disorders account for near, nearly one third of the overall disease burden in the United States. Um, they eclipse all other health conditions. Um, some of the issues are poor recognition of problems, um, historical patterns of discrimination, um, inadequate access to care, Again, this is why this addressing the social determinants of health is so critical to improving health equity, uh, ensuring that everyone in our community has equal access to these resources. Um, the under detection and under treatment and lack of organized prevention are, uh, are also factors in this. And um, consistent with these negative impacts, behavioral health disorders are associated with substantial expenses and lost employment opportunities. We take a comprehensive um, approach to our wraparound services. And as you can see, if you look at the diagram, um, it really mirrors the, the earlier wheel that we showed of the social determinants of health. Um, uh, so areas like educational opportunities, legal services, financial support, um, case management, family and friends, these are all things that, that are uh, included in our Bureau. Housing is so critical to what we do. Um, and uh, there, uh, a lot, of, a lot of our approach uh, includes supportive housing where we have uh, on-site staff with people um, in the community setting um, so that they can get 24-hour support um, with any issues that might come up and really set them up for success in the community. Um, supportive housing is an evidence-based practice um, and we do use permanent and affordable housing. Safe and permanent housing can give residents the stability that they need to organize their lives and their health. And then studies show that uh, once people are in their own housing, the formerly homeless community is much more receptive to interventions and social service support. And as we mentioned earlier, that was certainly borne out in the outreach that we did uh, in the homeless community during the COVID lockdown, where we used um, unoccupied hotels uh, so that people could have single occupancy room rather than a congregate shelter to mitigate the spread of COVID. Um, and we and many of these people um, had not been connected to services for many, many years. 
Um, and at the end of, of the COVID lockdown, over 50% of them um, had re-engaged with our services. The wraparound services that we use are an ideal community based model for people with multiple complex social needs. And the services that we offer include comprehensive case management and care coordination. Um, that includes a range of services to support people in successful community living with a case manager to really coordinate all of the services and make sure that uh, all the resources that could benefit the individual are being leveraged uh, to their benefit. And so th those would include things like housing, employment, um, educational opportunities, uh, primary care, and of course, treatment services. Um, we touched on primary care before on the importance of that. And that's uh, one of the, the critical pieces of our wraparound services. And then in terms of employment, we're able to offer job training and placement, uh, as well as facilitating access to work supports like childcare and transportation assistance. Uh, peer support is, is an evidence-based practice that's been shown to drive engagement and outcomes for people in recovery. Um, we utilize certified peers um, and the peers leverage their shared understanding, respect and mutual empowerment um, to engage the individual uh, in, a, in a trusting relationship. Um, peers support people in becoming and staying engaged in recovery and reducing the likelihood of relapse. Transportation um, allows people to have support to travel to jobs, appointments, grocery shopping. And then uh, we discussed our work in community inclusion where we are promoting non-segregated housing um, and creating opportunities for people to engage in meaningful mainstream activities that have purpose. And then our medical legal partnership um, allows people to address any unresolved legal issues in a timely manner. We also have resources uh, for financial literacy uh, through a statewide program that provides workshops on basics like budgeting, balancing a checkbook and understanding spending. And then we discuss the, the nutritional counseling that we provide. Employment is so critical as a recovery pathway for people that we serve. 60% of the individuals served by the public mental health system want to work, but unemployment among this group is more than three times that of the general population. Um, our wraparound services are inclusive of employment support. Uh, most of our community teams have a dedicated employment specialist to help connect the person uh, to opportunities for employment. And again, um, just to do a deeper dive into peer support, um, peer support is an evidence-based practice. Um, there is a wealth of information about peer support on the SAMHSA website. Uh, the link is provided at the bottom of the slide. And really the, the idea is that uh, the peers use their own lived experience and training to educate others, um, as we spoke about earlier, really to bring recovery to life for people, to, to advocate for the client, and to guide the client on a self-directed path to recovery. Um, that's really one of the most important features of peer support, is that, is that the individual is really in the driver's seat of their recovery, and the peer is there to help ampl amplify uh, their preferences. Peer support has been shown to reduce rates of hospitalization, engage people who may be considered difficult to reach, and decrease substance use. Um, another uh, finding is the reduction in the use of seclusion and restraint 
and the use of hospital and inpatient services as a result of peer support. And then uh, peer support improves the quality of life and engagement with services. Um, and it was declared an evidence-based practice in 2007 by our Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The concept of peer support has its roots in the self-help movement that began in the 1970s. Um, it, it was a time of intense focus on civil rights and social change, and people who had survived the abuses of psychiatric hospitals came together to support each other, work towards healing, and work towards transforming the services. And they understood that there was more to recovery than symptom management and that people who had been hospitalized could support one another um, in living meaningful lives in the community. And with that, I will, uh, I will pause uh, for any questions or comments, anything that Susan or Pearl might want to add. I actually have a question on peer support. Um, how did you get to a point where your peer support model actually got to your peers actually actually got to a point where they it became a profession and these people became trained and certified peers as opposed to just people helping each other because i think the point we are right now um with our peer support system it's just keep i think we're at the point where you were in the 1970s where mm -hmm. people who've got lived experience are just coming together to help each other but there's no sort of peer certification there's no official peer training and all of that how did you move from that point um to yeah. where you are now where yeah yeah I, and i i think that's so important pearl um in terms of having a level playing field for peers and, and being able to integrate peers into the treatment setting. So I can speak for the history in Delaware. Um, in Delaware, uh, that process occurred about 10 years ago um, during our uh, a period of intense transformation. Um, over a five-year period, um, over 90% of the individuals that we serve transitioned from a hospital setting to a community setting. So there was a tremendous expansion in community-based services during that time. And that is when we undertook the, the certification development in Delaware. Um, and that's something where there's really a wealth of information on how to do that. And I know when you were visiting us, um, you had a chance to meet our partners at the Mental Health Association in Delaware. Uh, we worked closely with them and with the certification board in Delaware to develop our training. Um, we would be happy to talk more about the curriculum and the process that we went through with the certification board, but it really is a very rigorous process. Um, and, and that was intentional, you know, so that it was a, a we ended up with a credential that people take seriously. Okay, does anyone have any other questions, comments, or reactions? Anything they would like us to go deeper with? Susan, is there anything you would like to add as well? Oh, no, I have no, I <laughs> Okay, anyone else would like to add anything? Or any questions on? Um, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to find out how do you guys get your funding? Is it like um, sponsored by your government, or do you have any activities that you do to raise money to keep your your project running by itself? Susan, would you be able to speak to that? I'm going to try my mic one more time. So. I don't know. I, it, it's giving feedback. Uh, do you have another device connected as well at the same time? I don't think so. OK. Um, I 
I don't know why it's giving feedback. Could you could you Is check uh, Renaissance here? Could you check that another browser tablet tab is not logged in? Just, just make sure there's only one browser tab. Sometimes you logged in from another browser tab or another browser. Oh, okay. okay. I don't know why it's maybe while you're trying to figure that out, I have a question that's related to the previous one. Okay. Maybe it can be answered together. So I was wondering about the certification process and whether the participants are sponsored or it's uh, a program which they need to pay for. Um, we are able to op to offer the training at no cost. Um, another thing that we are offering as a result of our federal funding for opioid response um, are paid internships for people who need to complete the 1,000 hours of work experience um, in addition to the training to be eligible to sit for the exam. So um, that's something that our, our provider agencies have really appreciated because they get extra staff. Uh, we, we've included an incentive to um, offset the time that they spend supervising the individual. Um, and so that, that has been um, a very popular feature. Um, the other thing I can add about the certification process is that it's something that we developed with representation from all of the relevant stakeholders in Delaware. So that included peers, provider agencies, um, the, the director of our certification board, so really, uh, we had a multifaceted input into the certification process. And we have regular meetings with the certification board to make sure that our training is still relevant. Um, you know, if there's anything that we need to tweak or, or enhance with it. Um, and then uh, we offer continuing education uh, for the peers as well. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, Susan, is your microphone working now? <laughs> Testing. Okay, yeah, I think it's okay, yeah, it is. <laughs> so weird. So I know there was a question earlier um, that you wanted me to answer, and I couldn't hear because the microphone was doing weird things. If, if you could repeat it, I'm happy to to share. Okay. Um, she was asking if how how you fund your activities as the department. So is it federal funded? Do you get grants or are they specific income activities that you as a department hold to get yourselves running? Sure, so it's, it's a combination, it's blended funding. We do receive federal funds um, just because we're a state, but we also receive money from the general fund tax base. So in Delaware, everyone has to pay a tax of some sort. So there's an allocation that we get from that. We do apply for grants um, from both public and private foundations, um, like RWJ, Robert Wood Johnson, for instance, Casey Foundation. Those organizations are available. Um, they often present opportunities to get funding, especially if you're being creative with trying to figure out how to offer treatment and parity. Then we also, with our insurance companies, we, we set up our programs where we can bill private insurance for certain portions. And then while it's federal, it's not really a grant, it's a match. Um, we have Medicaid that also pays 50%. So the state would pay, you know, CAF and then the feds through Medicaid would pay half. So again, it's definitely blended funding. Some, some programs we implement with a sliding fee scale. So people pay what they can that helps contribute to offsetting the cost. And then what they can't, if they're uninsured or underinsured, then we, the state of Delaware, will pay for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Luana Lady, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. 
Okay, thank You're you. Does anyone welcome. have any? Does anyone have any questions or comments? You can use the chat if your audio is not working. Or anything you would like, to, anything additional you would like them to add on or go deeper on, you can just use the chat. Okay. So I think we can move. Be if if I can just also add, like, when you're looking at developing a system, you know, I can't emphasize how important it is to be able to, to collect data, to tell the story, and to be able to measure um, the efficacy of what you're doing. We, I, I truly believe that that's why we were able to move forward, especially in some really difficult spaces, because sometimes it's, you know, like, especially like around with prevention, it's hard to prove a negative. But if you're able to, again, capture data to show that people like pre and post interventions and how well they're doing, I think, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. It's, you know, it will help you be able to gain more um, support for, for, you know, any, any, whether it's residential, whether it's inpatient, outpatient, community-based, again, like I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be able to, to demonstrate the positive things that are happening because of the initiatives and interventions. Okay, thank you so much for that, Susan. And sure. I think for me, the biggest struggle that I've had with peer support, I think, has been people not seeing how important it is or how important lived experience is in the recovery process. So for me, I, even with my own um, recovery process or treatment, I think peer support played such a huge role because there was certain things. I couldn't always access my professional, for example. I couldn't always access my therapist, but my peer was there. My peers were there a lot more often and they had, they understood exactly where I was standing. And I felt like because they had that experience, it's, it was something that I could easily communicate to them and I could easily um, be understood by them. Yeah, so I think the difficulty has been in just trying to get, um, especially with like the, um, the hospitals and the people providing the actual treatment, the biggest challenge has been uh, them integrating peers into their treatment and recovery model. That's a great observation, Pearl. Um, and there really is a substantial uh, uh, body of published papers on the evidence of the, the impact of peer support. Um, I'm part of a national organization on recovery support services, and um, we worked with someone to develop a one pager on the return on investment with peer support and also a bibliography um, on the evidence for peer support. So I, I would be glad to uh, pull those resources and share them for your review, you know, in the event that, that they could be helpful. Okay, thank you so much, Alexia. Does anyone have any other questions before we move on? Okay. Pearl, can I, can I ask a question? Are, yeah. Is peer support used in any other type of medical conditions in your area? I think, I think I've seen I, someone, uh, well, the other the participants can help me answer this, but mm -hmm. I have seen quite more, actually, more peer support being used in HIV treatment mm -hmm. than I have seen in, um, in mental health, especially. I've seen... I think especially with like um, adolescents, I have seen quite a bit of peer support services. And the reason why I'm asking or pointing it out is like that may be a good place to start to just to show um, the parallels, like, you know, understanding that mental health is a mental, you know, it's a, it's a physical health condition. It just deals with the brain. And that since there are other systems that are benefiting greatly from peer support, that this would be no different. 
And so sometimes if you can draw the parallels between the two, it'll help um, with stigma and to you know, strengthen your argument as to why it should be um, considered more widely in the mental health space. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Luana Lady, maybe you can help. Is there any other um, places where peer support is used in treatment? I know you've got more. So I know, yeah. I know in communities, um, there's peer support offered for children with um, learning disabilities and things like that. So if you have a child who is differently abled, you're able to enroll at a specific community center where you offer, um, where they offer services for physio especially, and mothers can get together and maybe discuss how they can help or how they can move forward or raise money for things like um, wheelchairs, walking aids and things like that. Otherwise, I'm not 100% sure on everything else, but I do know specifically for children there is. Okay, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any additions or comments? Anything to add on? I can see uh, uh, the Renaissance has actually commented that there's more support, more support has been observed in HIV and physical illness than mental health. Yeah, that's very true. I have seen, even I know we, why I even mentioned on adolescence, I know um, they have peer services within high schools as well for HIV and also sexual and reproductive health rights. But I haven't really seen much on mental health. But I guess that is a starting point. Okay. So um, anyone else, any comments? Or we can move on to the next part section. Okay, I think we can move. Um, I don't know if, I, I can't even remember who was sharing the screen, whether it was Alexia or Susan. I think we can move to the next part. And I, I think the next part, Pearl, uh, the slide just was really highlighting that um, this is an opportunity to co-develop the vision for Zambia through facilitated dialogue um, at, at this part of the workshop. Yeah, so I think this part of the workshop actually requires a lot more um, engagement and interaction with the participants. And what do you think, as participants, what do you think um, should be our vision for Zambia with regards to the social determinants of health? Where should we be heading, or what do you? What would you like to see? Mm. Gambo, would you like to help us with <laughs> you having worked in the community? Um, is there yes, anything I that you're working. seeing? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I comes to my mind is um, I make reference to a, a, a secondary school in my community and so it's a reference point for most of the things that I'm talking about today. Um, one thing that I observe is that there are no extracurricular activities anymore at the school. Um, somehow it's been scraped out of their um, curriculum altogether but I feel like that would be a great opportunity um, to, to include um, mental health conversations. And also uh, when I think about peer support um, or just having healthy environments to have uh, meaningful conversation um, um, in schools that uh, maybe let me give a little bit of background. When I was in high school, we had different clubs that we could be a, a part of first aid, um, some art. Um, we had uh, like uh, cultural groups, um, even things like um, sports clubs. I don't see that anymore. I feel like if that was um, a priority 
for example, at the school that I'm referring to, then part of the activities there would be to include conversations with with um, um, people that are able to um, give support to uh, students who wouldn't otherwise have a platform um, to engage in those kinds of um, conversation. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, that was something that I was thinking about. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. And um, I have noticed, I think, um, like I said earlier on, that we have very limited extracurricular activities and um, recreational activities. And I agree with you, especially in the lower income communities. And this is not because they don't want necessarily to participate or to actually get involved in them. If anything, they're one of the, the low income communities or like majority of the communities that I've worked in are the most willing to participate in whatever activities you take for them. Um, and I say this because initially when we did start um, doing work in the community, we had started with um, football as a source of support like a support group for um, alcohol and drug abuse, and we're using football. And the people in the team showed up every single week. Even when we couldn't play or the ground was taken, they actually showed up all the time. And you find that just because they have that extra activity or extra recreational activity, uh, they wouldn't spend their time doing nothing, lounging around, uh, drinking alcohol and smoking. But there's such a huge gap there because um, they're also very dependent on people outside the community coming into the community to create these extracurricular activities. So I think it's also important for us, if we're creating a recreational model of some sort, it's important that it's also a sustainable one. So even like with the football group, sometimes I wouldn't show up for it. Initially, if I don't show up, nothing would happen. But we created some sort of sustainability where the, the guys now would still go ahead and have their meetings and they would still um, have their discussions or their support groups, even without me there. So besides just taking them there, they need to be sustainable and the people in the community need to be able to go on with these activities without you even going to the community to actually um, facilitate these activities, if that makes sense. Yeah. Just a thought there, Pearl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I was thinking about the school approach because I have been to some activities that have been organized by um, the community. For example, mm -hmm. like football games and um, netball. Um, and I find that those are the places. Like I'm very observant when I attend such events. Mm -hmm. I'm very, uh, I've noticed that they actually the place where all of these uh, um high schoolers and teenagers actually go and and yeah. um, participate in all those illicit um, activities that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So the drinking and the, the drugs and all of those things I have observed um, will take place there. That's a place where all of these, all of these um, um, young Vices men and women take, yeah. Together. Yeah. So, mm. and that's why I was thinking if, if like a the, sort of school based uh, approach, yeah, the school based approach, because then the pressure is off. Um, like the community can participate in something that is a school initiative um, rather than sort of be the initiators. Yeah. Um, or, or something like that. So anyway, that's just, that's just something that I was thinking about as you were. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, and yes, I think a school-based approach is important, but I've also found that the school-based approach with um, with a recreation especially leaves out the people who are not in school. So like when you think about a sports day or a sports team, a football sports team, for example, football team, right? 
um, if it's for the school, it will only allow people within the school to participate in it. Whereas if you are having it within the community, I think it needs to be structured for you to have a level of uh, control over what's going on. So like most, for example, football, right? Most of the community leagues and community teams within the community um, have got very strict rules, especially when it comes to alcohol, when it comes to drugs as well. They're very um, strict on that. And you're not, if you're part of the team, especially, I'm not sure about the people on the outside, but if you're part of the team, they're very actually very strict on that and it's very structured. Um, I don't know if you've heard of, I think they're called Afrofusion. I can't even remember what they're called, something like that. They're a dance group, uh, a recreational dance club, actually, in Baleni. And uh, Afrofusion takes up quite a lot of the children's time in the afternoon. And they're not allowed to drink. They're not allowed to show up drunk. They're not allowed to show up smelling of, of alcohol or like cigarettes and all of that. So what happens, what tends to happen is because they meet every, I think they meet every four days, they take up the whole afternoon after school. And because of that structure and the rules that they've put in place and even just the conversations that they have after the sessions, it's not just going there, you show up, you dance and leave. The conversations that take place after the session are sort of peer sessions where you actually talk about, they talk about hygiene, they talk about the dangers of alcohol, the dangers of drugs, and all of those, um, oh, she's dropped off, yeah, all of those itty gitty details. And I think it's just, it's so important to have a sort of structure. And without the structure, I completely agree with you. That's where most of these people show up now for the, to drink and smoke and do all of those illicit things. Yeah. I don't know if anyone has any other comments or any uh, observations that they've come across. If your audio is not working, please feel free to use the chat. Yes, Pupu Zandi? Hi. Hi. Yeah. Pupu Zandi here. So I think that um, having support from... Um, a policy perspective uh, is essential. I, I like what Ingambo was saying, growing up through the schools, uh, I think we had a bit more support as children, uh, but now you don't see those things happening a lot, a lot more now. Um, but perhaps to have, uh, to draw parallels from um, the environment from which Susan, Alexia, and our colleagues are, 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 um, are exposed, and really sh sort of show evidence-based um, uh, actions and initiatives that have been done and outcome which we can adopt here and then and then sort of you know start singing about these things with policymakers um, because a lot of things uh, are around here are uh, are determined from that level. So if, uh, say, the Ministry of Education um, passes uh, and, you know, says we will discontinue, say, uh, sport and things like that in the school, that's it. Or we'll limit, because there was an accident last year, we are limiting sport activity this year. That's the kind of things we've seen here happen. So things which were beneficial um, no one paid attention to them and they were then scrapped off because they were just costs to schools. Um, so um, basically what I'm trying to say is can we, are there parallels we can draw from there in terms of policy um, that can be helpful here? Is there anything else that can be done? Can we collaborate at that level that um, you know, like Pearl had the experience, can we can we come with people from ministries of schools and health and all that and and do some sort of tour um, to really help them see, as they come up with policies, see this great benefit that comes from, um, that, that, that comes from being structured the way you guys are structured. Uh, and, and we do a lot of that. I, I don't know how many trips people have made into Europe and, and 
for, for other things, that is, which they came back and said, these things work, we saw them, we need to adopt this for our own society and, and things like that. So my concern is more on a policy perspective. Is there something we can learn from there? What is the federal government's policies around different things that we can challenge our own policy makers um, and sort of start driving towards, towards um, you know, a bit more adv advancement in this, in this area. I, I, hope, I hope it makes sense. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, it made perfect sense. In one place, if you haven't reviewed, I think would be good to start and we would be happy to furnish this for you, is things really started to change here when legislation was introduced around mental health parity. And that really forced all policymakers as well as clinicians, social services, um, social scientists to look at the fact that when you're when you're not providing, I don't want to say good care, but you know, best practices for all conditions, then you know your system is inherently flawed and not, you know, and and then I'm searching for words because I don't want it to sound negative because it's not, because you know, sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. But that legislation was huge for us. And it just started a ripple effect through the system where people had to recognize that it helped kill the stigma that, you know, again, this is just another illness. You know, it's not that people want to have, you know, problems no more than anybody wants to have diabetes. It just, it is what it is. So I think that would be huge just to see how the legislation was written, um, the points that were made, the arguments with it, because, you know, again, it's, I believe wholeheartedly that everyone wants to do the right thing. Sometimes people just don't know. Um, again, they just don't know what they don't know. So I think that would be a really good place to start. And then we can, you know, we'd be happy to send any other um, enabling language or policies that we have that speak to the standards. Again, that again, that one was a big one because you know the impetus was to make sure that people in your insurance coverage it would be covered just the same as it would any other disease state. But it, again, it was definitely a springboard because once people were forced to recognize that, um, they had to deal with the fact that you know people who have mental health needs are no different than folks who have any other type of healthcare need. Yeah, that, that would definitely be very helpful to see. And I like that you say that uh, you, you don't know what you don't know. And, and that's our situation mm -hmm. here. Uh, all we know is that there's a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. But you guys are pretty mature in terms of um, progress that you've made. Um, for instance, our national health insurance, um, I don't know what the equivalent is there, Pearl. Um, it's, it's very new, just started a couple of years ago, and you see that it's, it's, this, is, this is health insurance for all. So it's, it's focusing more on physical ailments and physical illness, and no mention of mental illness in there. And so you could see at policy level and implementation, um, mental health is already being left out in a lot of ways, um, mm -hmm. let alone um, other deeper aspects of mental health. So it, it would really be good to sort of see what journey you've been through and where, what regulation, um, mm -hmm. what specific regulations were enacted that then we can use uh, those of us who are in advocacy and, um, and awareness and all that can use that and keep, keep singing those songs. Absolutely. And the, the beneficial thing is that we were there exactly where you were. Um, and so you can draw the parallels to show that, you know, like the United States, they were in a similar situation where they had a healthcare system that didn't, um, I don't want to say didn't acknowledge, but clearly didn't provide the services and the coverage as necessary to folks with um, mental health needs. And we suffered because of it. And then when we 
finally figured it out, we brought in parity and we brought in other standards to make sure that the stigma you think, was lessened for sure. But if nothing else, people are able to get the help that they need. And we've seen tremendous benefits from doing so. So again, we would be happy to supply you with information so you can give them a real example of you know, a, a country that started out not acknowledging the fact that people are entitled to and need help. And then we finally got it right and how it's benefited our society as a whole. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing just on that, um, I think it's one thing for you, for us to have the legislation, but it's also another thing for us to implement it or have supportive legislation that or supportive policies that go with the legislation. I'm saying this because of the Mental Health Act, for example, right? It's there, mm -hmm. but how much policy is there to back that act? So you've got that act sitting there, but is there policy that actually backs what's in the Mental Health Act? Is there policy yes. that actually makes sure that this act is being implemented and the things that are in the Mental Health Act are being implemented? And I think that's where we're kind of falling short um, on the policy perspective here, especially. Sure. And um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, in a number of ways, you know, from the coverage perspective, you know, here, our insurance companies know clearly that they could be sued. And many times they are not just for the mental health, but for other things. But so they know that if they don't follow the rules, there will be um, backlash that will cost them money. In terms of um, standards, you know, one of our um, accreditation agencies that pretty much does everything from peds, adolescents, behavioral health, you know, you name it, any, any type of care is the Joint Commission. And they have a whole section, as, as the CMS, our federal partners, of rules and regulations that must be followed. So if you, and if you don't, as a provider organization, you will lose your accreditation, you'll lose your ability to do business. And so, for instance, the Joint Commission comes in to goes into any behavioral health facility triennially every three years. But if a client or a family member has a complaint about the standards and services, they can call. And as a matter of fact, their number, it's, it's a requirement that it's posted all over the facility. And then they can come in for calls. So there are a lot of interventions that are put in place to make sure that the rules are followed and that people receive the care that they're entitled to. And I'm happy to share that also. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Please use the chat or the, I think there's something in the Q&A actually. Um, yeah. So Kapenda is asking, identifying social support networks for different age groups and communities will allow us to advocate for policy reform and blended approaches that will help us achieve this goal in various communities. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. Um, I think it's one thing to just have general support, but it's also something to have uh, age-specific and community-specific um, supports. And also taking into consideration that different communities or different households have got different cultures and different perspectives. So it's um, definitely something to consider when we're coming up with a um, policy perspective. And, and we also in Delaware have a group called the Behavioral Health Consortium and it's codified. So it's, it's in the Delaware statutes, it's in the law. And this committee is a very diverse committee. It's made up of clinicians, social scientists, people in academia, um, people at large advocacy groups, it's very diverse. And their mission is to make sure that whatever we're doing in Delaware mirrors best practices at all times. Because again, like the, the field is always evolving. And so they are the checks and balances to make sure that as the field changes and best practices are improved, that we're not falling to the wayside, that we're not still doing, like we don't, we're not resting on our laurels that, 
we got this pass you know, 10 years ago, we're good. It's like, no, they make sure that every year we go back and review all of our policies and procedures and that we're implementing, that we're functioning at the best place we possibly can. So that's definitely something that you would want to consider is having this body with a very um, diverse group of stakeholders watching the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, does anyone have any comments or questions on that before I ask my next question? Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to find out is how did you transition from um, the medical model to the recovery model? Like you said, yeah, the medical model is still very important, but I know you've sort of transitioned from less institutionalization to more community-based residential services. And how was the transition experience for you? Was it um, and how have the outcomes been, like moving from institutionalization to residential and community setting? So as, so as we just talked about, you know, what are the checks and balances and the oversight? So we have the United States Department of Justice that can go into any state and they have Georgia, but, but they did this to Delaware. They came in um, and looked at our system and identified a number of places. This was back in 2007 that we could absolutely <clears throat> make improvements. So they mandated us to do so. And you know, I guess a federal legal agency, we had to. But part, so that was really the impetus for Delaware deciding how to best make sure that we weren't violating and make and having people live in the least restrictive environment. And in order to do that, you have to explore what supports can be developed for the community. So that was really the start of it. And then we had, again, these oversight agencies that were pushing like, how about this? How about that? And the one thing about it is when once it's codified and it's an expectation that you have a system that functions well, so for Alexi and I, you know, for the two of us, we are able to really, truly take the social determinants of health and lay those over, and lay that over any medical piece. And the way we explain it is we don't discount the medical piece because it's essential. You need that. So we basically say this is like the acute care part, like this is what saves somebody's life. And then once their lives are saved and they have to go back and continue to live. So we give them all the things that they need to continue to thrive and be able to function in the community. And hopefully they won't need another acute care bout, but if they do, it's fine. That's what the system exists for. But we're here to make sure that the majority of their time, because a small portion of your time is spent in acute care. Um, just like, again, we'll take somebody with diabetes. If, they, if they're having, you know, maybe they go into a diabetic coma because their numbers are really off. Well, then you don't keep them in the hospital forever. You know, you give them medication, they go back out and they may have counseling and a dietitian and a nutritionist, et cetera. We follow the same, we follow the same model that once they're stable, an individual stabilized, then in order to keep them stable, that's where we come into place. And people really, when I say people, whether it's the legislate, legislature, advocates, they've really appreciated it because they can see um, we have a number of stories, um, testimonies, the data, it all supports that people can be in recovery and can do well, but they need supports in order to do that. And that's why I was saying like, whatever you implement or pilot, make sure that there's a data component up front. From day one, you're able to capture the outcomes because I guarantee you, it's going to be overwhelmingly um, positive and proof that recovery is absolutely possible and it does work with the proper supports. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Okay, Luana, lady, sorry to put you on the spot. Um, I know you work in the hospital setting. Um, just how, what do you think we can do better with, like when it comes to more holistic care? 
and taking into consideration like all the different social determinants. So this, uh, like I know when you had your experience working in psychiatry or whatever, um, how can we move from that just sending these people home how do we now start to integrate, making sure that they're reintegrated, well integrated into the society? Like, what's the, what? What are the biggest challenges there? Um, okay, yeah. So I think the biggest challenge was that there was no actual triaging of patients when they come in. So you all take patients who are maybe you can take a patient who's schizophrenic, and you can take a patient who's suffering from maybe other symptoms like syphilis or whatever, and they would live together. So I feel like it negatively impacted a lot of patients in that a lot of them were unable to live outside the facility and there was no halfway point for where patients go afterwards because then you can't have somebody come in an acute phase and then send them back to the environment that they were in previously. I feel like it was coming up with something that was more cyclic because patients go home and come back and go home and come back and there's no real recovery in between. It's just moments of maybe like um, pseudo recovery. So it was a bit difficult to, to manage that because then even when you're managing a patient for the second, third time, fourth time, you're dealing with the same problem. You're not actually dealing with something new. It's not a relapse. Um, it's more or less the same condition that wasn't treated. And also, I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of gaps in how we research some of these things, because even for mental health specifically, there are, no, there are no actual baseline studies. So even the mental health bill that was generated doesn't really take into consideration what's really happening in our, our facilities where psychiatry is actually a big problem. Because even at UTH, which is our main referral center, we have a psychiatry wing, but it's not helpful to a point where you can transition patients for admission or you can send them to Chinama, which is the psychiatric hospital. It's not very helpful to do it either way. So we're kind of stuck sending patients home, which I feel is might not be an ideal practice for, especially with patients who are suffering from mental health issues. Um, that's so true. And I can actually give an example of um, an experience that we've had because of the same thing. So um, I have a family member that is a drug and alcohol addict. And because there's no fixed um, inpatient service, what would happen is we'll take them for their outpatient treatment. They would get their detox. If they stay in the hospital, they'll stay for seven days. And then they would be sent back home. And unfortunately, home is very close to where all these vices happen. So even if they've been detoxed, I think um, it recovery, it doesn't just end at the detox phase. It needs to be continuous. And because there's no continuity after they've left the psychiatric hospital, they end up relapsing or going back to the same thing or not even relapsing because they haven't necessarily been fully treated and they haven't fully recovered from their illness and you've just sent them home on the assumption that they're better so that's definitely a really big challenge and i found that reintegration is also a challenge where um this person now has spent maybe four or five years of their lives um, struggling with drug and alcohol abuse, for example. And that seven years of their lives, they they kind of lost touch with what's going on and they don't have this support structure that's going to help them reintegrate into normal life or reintegrate into society. So I think um, it, that's something to consider and that's definitely a gap um, in our model um, here in Zambia. And I can still hope says uh, for some time now i've been wanting to develop a support program for university and college students because i believe it's a place that so many people that are vulnerable to having an injured mental health because of all the freedom they have and considering that they are coming from a place um, of tight principles and then they meet contrary people and now at a place of 
confusion. That's very true. I think that comes with the adjustment also um, from high school and being at home where everything is controlled to now going into freedom and just doing everything on your own. Even class in university is about you. If you don't show up for class, that's no one is going to be really following you up and chasing you. So definitely there is a lot of confusion there and um, a support program. And I think even just support groups or peer support groups, there's not so many of them, even within the university, within the community, there's not so much support ongoing. So I agree with you, Hope. That's such a good idea. It's a brilliant idea. And Ale, do you want to say something? Oh, yes. Um, I was saying, I think also on the point of transitioning, another thing that we have in our country that's a problem is a social stigma. People find it very difficult to go back to the communities when they've been um, accessing help for mental health issues because there's that immediate fear and that immediate stigma. And people really aren't that keen to help you anymore because they're scared and they feel like maybe what you have is something that could spread or that could harm them. So I think also just based on ignorance and just not being well educated based on some of these things makes it a lot harder to send people back into the communities after treatment. Thanks for that, Naledi, and yeah, I, I completely agree with you. Um, I don't, Susan and Alexa, do you have any comments on that? Alexia, do you have anything, or else I can certainly add? Yeah, I, I certainly can jump in on that. Um, one of the things that we utilize a lot is having people work with a peer to develop um, a self-directed wellness plan. Um, and that can include things like what the person identifies they need to do every day to stay well. Um, it can also include how they identify if they're starting to become unwell, what are the signs, and um, the person can develop a proactive plan of what they can do to address address those signs and who they can turn to for support. And actually as part of the process, the person reaches out to the supporter ahead of time and, and confirms what the support that they would like and that the person can agree to it. Um, so again, that's, you know, that's a, another benefit of peer support. Um, and that is something where we, in addition to in-person peer support, we've been able to utilize digital peer support during COVID. Okay, thank you so much. And I think that's helpful. Um, Susan, did you want to add something to that? No, I think what Alexia said, um, hit the nail on the head, but I will tell you that as systems are developed, and I know it feels right now because you don't have a formal system that stigma's rampant, but once systems start becoming developed, people will, the tolerance changes. And I, I hate to use the word tolerance, but maybe it's more acceptance changes. And then you don't have as much, you know, you, you don't see as much of that until Alexia's point there, like even with technologies, technology, there's so many ways, like we are very careful, like even with housing that we don't label the housing, if it's in the community, like you, we, we have group homes and you wouldn't know unless you know. So we don't, you know, publicize, but, and, but we've taken that and that approach has spread. So now when we have people, for instance, coming out who are justice involved coming out of prisons, we don't label the houses. Cause so, so, you know, it has definitely caused a sense of people kind of waking up and realizing the damage that is being done where people like feel like they don't want to get treatment because of, you know, what she just, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name, what you just described. Um, it, it, we recognize that that was very real and that was a, that we put together a deliberate campaign to make sure that people don't feel stigmatized or singled out and put in certain places. And, and with technology now, um, we have apps that people can actually talk through. And again, this is people who feel like they're starting to, um, 
to not be in a good space and just want, you know, they want to reach out and get some help before they go into a crisis. So we have apps that people can use on their phones. We have, um, she mentioned telemedicine where folks can call up on their phone and, you know, like WhatsApp or FaceTime a clinician just to, you know, make sure that they don't go to a place that's, um, that's not good for them. So there are, there are, while you're developing the program, there are a lot of things that you can put in place from the very beginning um, that will help you see a drastic reduction in that type of stigma that could keep people from um, seeking services. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I was looking at, during the break, I was looking at the link you sent for the Oxford housing. Um, do you have that in Delaware or do you have something similar or how, how, how exactly does it work? Um, we, we do have Oxford houses in Delaware. Um, and mm -hmm. as I'm sure you saw, Oxford house has been around since I think around the mid 1970s. Um, so the Oxford houses are self-governed. So Oxford house, um, purchases, um, homes in the community um, in, you know, in a variety of neighborhoods, and then the houses are self-governed. So the, the residents of the house screen new residents and vote on whether or not to accept them. They come up with the code of conduct for the house. And then, um, everyone in the house is responsible for contributing a certain amount towards the expenses of the house every week. And so that is a way that um, we've been able to, to have quite a few recovery residences in our community um, mm -hmm. to mitigate the issue that, that you described. You know, if someone is in a short-term uh, treatment, they don't want to go back to the same environment, to the, the people, places, and things that, that were the trigger for that. Um, so the residents of the Oxford House are all in recovery and they all support one another um, in their recovery while they're living together. So is there like, um, like a sort of head of the house or someone who kind of manages the house or like a peer that's already gone through the recovery process that um, manages how the house is run and ensures that people are not uh, relapsing there's no um illicit drugs or alcohol being brought into the premises is there someone that manages the house or oversees the house yes oxford house does have that infrastructure in place at the state level um and and those are people who have lived experience in recovery who manage the houses Um, Hope, did you want to say something? Or does anyone else want to add or say something? Or any questions? The, the other thing I'll add, Pearl, is that um, oftentimes when we've gone to stand up a new, a new resource and we are dealing with issues of stigma, um, oftentimes it just takes one person who has a family member or their own personal experience who gets us in the door and we're able to go from there. You know, that was the experience when we wanted to add nutritional counseling. Um, I had heard someone speak at a conference. I reached out to her. We had a meeting where I, I pitched what I had in mind and it turned out that she has a close family member who has schizophrenia and she said, I, how can I help? So, um, you know, I know that we've talked a lot of today about stigma and barriers, but I just want to reinforce that message of hope that oftentimes all it takes is that one person um, to, to turn things in a different direction. Okay, thank you for that, um, Susan. Um, does anyone have any additions, any contributions or any questions, anything they would like to see um, a certain place they would like us to get when it comes to holistic mental health care. If your mic or your audio isn't working, please uh, type in the chat or in the Q&A. Okay. Uh, 
Um, I think I don't have any questions as well. I've exhausted that. Um, I think the next thing was just the debrief, right? Yes. Okay. Mm. Okay, so I think we've we kind of delved into um into detail on the different aspects of the social determinants, screening for social needs, and the importance of using these lenses to achieve um, a level of mental health equity, at least. And uh, thank you so much, um, Alexia and Susan. It's been very insightful learning from your experiences and where you're coming from and where you are right now. And hopefully we'll get there soon. I think we're still very much in the infancy stages with the mental health sector and especially with the um, the social aspect of mental health especially and recovery and how it's it's been very helpful and eye-opening to see where we can go and the potential that we have and the different challenges and how we can deal with them um, I don't know if anyone has any feedback or any insight that they, or anything that was just on their mind as we were going through this session. Especially on where we are right now with Zambia. Okay. Are you feeling shy to talk? <laughs> Okay, um, Alexa and Susan, do you have any insights, anything that came up during the session that you would like to speak on or touch on? Is yeah, there anything I mean, I'm sorry, that it's we discussed in the session? Yeah. No, I mean, I think it was really good conversation. I definitely want to reiterate that anything that we can provide to you. Um, I have the list of things we talked about, the policy, the legislation, and so forth. But even like, you know, like once this is over, if someone you know has a thought like, oh, I wish I would have asked, um, you, you know how to get in touch with us. We're wide open and over the moon excited about being able to help in this important space. So I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. Okay. Thank you so much. Um... I will, yes, as I, whoever needs to reach out to Alexia and Susan after the session, and I think we will be doing quite a bit of work together. We have a project coming up, which will be focused on um, Zambia and creating a recovery model for Zambia. So if you want to reach out, if there's anything you can think about, anything you think should be included in our model, if you want to participate and join us, in coming up with this model please reach out to myself or alexa it's um yeah it's actually really exciting we were hoping we could do this in person even the conference and everything so it's more interactive but we've got the next best thing so um alexa has dropped her email in the chat does anyone have any comments yes Ngabu, go ahead there's so much information that was shared um, on, on the screen and I was taking down some notes, but I really couldn't capture everything. And I was wondering if we have access to any of this information, um, the slides or um, any sort um, of information package related to this. Work? Yeah, we're, we're happy to share the slides. And then um, if there's any area that you would like to discuss more, we can always set up a Zoom. Um, you know, we can coordinate with Pearl, but we're happy to to talk more about any aspect of it that interested you. Um, this has just been such a pleasure to to hear about all the work that you're doing. Yeah, um, Zianji here. We will be sharing the link to this recorded session, just, just so that uh, in case you missed out any part, you can. Uh, follow through at your own pace and time and and forward and re and rewind what we have to do. So, so we'll share link to this this workshop, the, the morning one and, and this one. 
Thank you for presenting. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, does anyone have any other questions? Any anything you'd like to add? Any concerns? Um, Pearl, I would just like to say that if there are any future uh, meetings and all of those things you talked about, Zoom sessions, even just participating and hearing what you're up to, what the follow through to this looks like, I would like to be a part of that. Okay, I will we'll run through, I'm just trying to pull up, um, we will be speaking about our next Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay, I hope this works now. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we can hear now. Yeah, so I was saying, um, I'm dropping my email address in the chat as well. And um, I will also run through briefly the next steps post this and how you can maybe get involved in coming up with a recovery model for Zambia. Um, I think we're still, like I said earlier on, we're still a bit far back when it comes to recovery, we're more focusing on treatment. We're making steps, making strides, but we've still got so much uh, more work to do. And I think coming up with a sustainable model is a collaborative process and will involve pretty much everyone. So I have dropped my email address. Um, I think the next thing, the next slide is just next steps and what, else we're doing in the social determinants of health All right um okay does anyone have any other questions the debrief before we go into next steps okay so pretty much uh, like I said earlier on, thank you so much, Alexia and Susan, again. Um, we I will be working with Susan and Alexia um, more in the next in the next few months. We, uh, like I said in the introduction, I met Susan and Alexia during my Mandela Washington Fellowship, and the U.S. Department of State gave us the opportunity to uh, participate in the reciprocal exchange program. Um, yeah, they gave us the opportunity to participate in the reciprocal exchange program, which gives us the opportunity to create partnerships between American professionals and the Zambian alumni or Zambian fellow. And for Susan and my, uh, Alexia and myself, our focus has been on, will be on building a holistic rehabilitation and recovery model for Zambia. And we do have quite a few activities um, lined up. And some of them include um, stakeholder meetings with all of you, 
I think everyone is a stakeholder in this. We have reached out to the Ministry of Health already, um, and we will be reaching out to the rest of the partners as we go along, community development. I think as we went through the presentation today, we saw that um, it's a multi-sectoral uh, effort. So we will reach out to other stakeholders. We will have um, brainstorm sessions with everyone just to see how we can improve our recovery and rehabilitation model for Zambia. So I have dropped my email address. If you're interested in participating in this, I will reach out to Renaissance and um, other key stakeholders as well and send through the project information just uh, to see if how we can work together and how we can work towards uh, improving health outcomes or mental health outcomes for Zambia. Um, I can see there's a comment in the chat. I joined towards the end because I was attending the grief counseling session, so I do not hear what was discussed uh, earlier, but I like the point that Hope raised about support programs in colleges and universities. I also think that should be considered in primary and secondary schools, especially for those facing family problems. With the little that I have heard in this session, I know there is hope for this country where mental health is concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Walia. Um, does anyone else have any other comments or questions? Uh, please feel free to reach out to Alexia, Susan, or myself, and then we can discuss next steps more and see how we can move from here. We've identified what the challenges are. We've seen where the gaps are. So how can we use those challenges to actually move forward and create something better for Zambia. Okay. Um, Alexia and Susan, do you have anything to share? Any last remarks? Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, it was wonderful to meet everyone, and I look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you so much. Okay, and I know it's, um, I was really worried about the time difference for you guys especially. Uh, so I know it's taken a lot of effort on your end. We're really grateful. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. It was absolutely worth it. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Um, I think that's about the end of the session, right? Have I left out anything? I think that's about it. Yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, right. Susan. Alexia. All right. Absolutely. All right. Bye for now. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.